If you remember yesterday, uh, Omri had um, lost the key to the um, cupboard. They weren't able to make it work. So now we'll see. They were sitting around and Little Bear was super unhappy because he wanted his wife uh, or Omri to put the plastic female Indian in the cupboard. So let's see what happens today. A movement near the back of the house caught Omri's eye. It was his mother coming out to hang up some wet clothes. He thought she moved as if she were tired and fed up. She stood for a moment on the back balcony looking at the sky, then she sighed and began pegging the clothes to the line. On impulse, Omri got up and went over to her. You haven't found anything of mine, have you? he asked. No, I don't think so. <clears throat> what have you lost? Omri was too ashamed to admit he'd lost the key she told him to be so careful with. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. Oh, nothing much, he said. He went back to Patrick, who was showing the men an ant. Boone was trying to pat his head, but it wasn't very responsive. Well, Omri said, we might as well make the best of things. Why not bring the horses out and give the fellows a ride? This cheered everyone up and Omri ran up and bought, uh, brought the two horses down carefully in an empty box. Next, Patrick stamped out about two square feet of the lawn hard to give the horses a really good gallop. And quite a large black beetle alighted on the flattened part and Little Bear shot it dead with an arrow. This cheered him up a bit more, though not much. While the horses grazed the fresh grass, he kept giving great lovesick sighs and Omri knew he was thinking of the woman. Maybe you'd rather not stay in the night now, Omri said to Patrick. I want to, said Patrick, if you don't mind. Omri felt too upset to care one way or the other. When they were called in to supper, he noticed that Adil was trying to be friendly, but Omri wouldn't speak to him. Afterward, Adil took him aside. What's up with you now? I'm trying to be nice. I got your silly old cupboard back. It's no good without the key. Well, I'm sorry. It must have dropped out on the way up to the attic. On the way up to the attic? Omri hadn't thought of that. Will you help me find it? He asked eagerly. Please, it's terribly important. Oh, all right. The four of them hunted for half an hour. They didn't find it. After that, Gillen and Adil had to go out for some function at school, so Patrick and Omri had the television to themselves. They took out the two men and explained this new magic and then they all watched together. First came a film about animals, which absolutely transfixed both the little men. Then a Western came on. Omri thought they ought to switch it off, but Boone, in particular, set up such a good hullabaloo that even Omri said, oh, all right, just for 10 minutes then. Little Bear was seated cross-legged on Omri's knee, while Boone, who had been somehow gravitate, or had, who had somehow gravitated back to Patrick, preferred to stand in his breast pocket, leaning his elbows along the top of the pocket with his hat on the back of his head, chewing a lump of tobacco he had on him. Patrick, who'd heard something about uh, something of Cowboy's habit, said, Don't you dare spit. Don't you spit around here, you know. Let me listen, uh, listen to him talking, will you, said Boone. I just can't get over how they talk. But before the ten minutes was up, the Indians in the film, I'll show you something real quick. There's a picture there of the boys sitting watching uh, TV. Little bear cross-legged right there. Yeah, you'll kind of see that. And then Boone sitting in the pocket of Patrick there. Let's see, before 10 minutes was up, the Indians in the film started to get the worst of it. It was the usual sequence in which pioneers' wagons were drawn into a circle and the Indians are galloping around while the outnumbered men of the wagon fire muzzle-loaded guns at them through the wagon wheels. Omri could sense Little Bear was getting restive and tense. As brave after brave bit the dust, he suddenly slept, leapt to his feet. No good pictures, he shouted. What you talking about? Boone yelled tauntingly across the chasm, um, dividing him from Little Bear. That's how it was. My, pa, my mama and pa was in a fight like that. Then, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to read this carefully because it's him talking with a southern accent and i got to make sure I don't mispronounce it. Let's see. Mama and pa was in a fight like that. 
And my pa told me he done shot nearly 15, 20 of them dirty savages. White men move on to land, use our water, kill our animals. So what? Let the best man win and we won. Yippee! He added as another television Indian went down with his horse on top of him. Omri was looking at the screen when it happened. In a lull in the soundtrack, he heard a faint, thin whistling sound and heard Boone grunt. He looked back at Boone swiftly and his blood froze. The cowboy had an arrow sticking out of his chest. Remember the little photo or the little picture? For a couple of seconds, he remained upright in Patrick's breast pocket. Then, quite slowly, he fell forward. Omri had often marveled at the way people in films, particularly girls and women, were given to letting out loud screams at dramatic or awful moments. Now he felt one rise in his own throat, and he would have let it out if Little Bear had not cried out first. Patrick, who had not noticed anything amiss till now, looked at Little Bear, he saw where his bow arm was still pointing, and looked down at his own pocket. Over the top of it, Boone hung, head down, as limp as a piece of knotted string. Boone! Boone! No! snapped Omri. Don't touch him! Ignoring Little Bear, who tumbled down his trouser leg to the floor as he moved, Omri very carefully lifted Boone clear between finger and thumb and laid him across the palm of his hand. The cowboy lay face up with the arrow sticking out of his chest. Is he dead? whispered Patrick in horror. I don't know. Should, shouldn't we take the arrow out? We can't. Little Bear must. With infinite care and slowness, Omri laid his hand on the carpet. Boone lay perfectly still. With such a tiny body, it was impossible to be sure whether the arrow was stuck in where his heart was or a little higher up towards his shoulder. The arrow shaft was so fine you could only make it out by the clear, by the minute cluster of feathers. Little Bear, come here. Omri's voice was steely, a voice Mr. Johnson himself might have in, uh, invaded in command obedience, or it commanded obedience. So I think it was probably more a little bear, come here. You imagine me saying that if somebody was acting up at school. Little bear, scrambling to his feet after his fall, walked unsteadily to Omri's hand. Get up there and you see if you've killed him. Without a word, Little Bear climbed onto the edge of Omri's hand and knelt down beside, the, uh, beside Boone. He laid his ear against his chest just below the arrow. He listened, then he straightened up, but without looking at either of the boys. Not killed, he said sullenly. Omri felt his breath go out in relief. Take the arrow out, carefully. If he dies now, it'll be your fault. Little Bear put one hand on Boone's chest and his fingers on the other side of the arrow and with the other took hold of the shaft where it had gone into Boone's body. Blood come. Need to stop up hole. Omri's mother kept boxes of tissues in every room mainly so nobody would have an excuse to sit sniffling. Patrick jumped up and brought this, er, jumped up and brought this, tearing off a tiny corner and rolling it into a wad no bigger than a pinhead. Now it's got the germs from your hand, said Omri. Where's the disinfectant? In the bathroom cupboard. Don't let my mom see you. While Patrick was gone, Omri sat motionless and silent, his eyes fixed on Little Bear, still poised to pull out the arrow. After a very long minute, the Indian muttered something. Omri bent his head low. What? Little Bear, sorry. Omri straightened up, his heart cold and untouched. You'll be a lot sorrier if you don't save him, was all he could say. Patrick raced back with the bottle of Listerine. He poured a drop into the lid and dipped the little ball of tissue in it. Then he held the cap close to Little Bear. Go on, Omri ordered. Pull it. Little Bear seemed to brace himself. Then he began to tremble. Little Bear not do. Little Bear not doctor. Get doctor back. He take care of wound, or he, he make wound good. Uh, we can't, said Omri. The magic's gone. You must do it. Do it now, little bear. Again, the Indian stiffened, closing his hand tightly around the arrow. Slowly and steadily, he drew it out and threw it aside. Then, as the blood welled over Boone's checked shirt, 
Little Bear swiftly, swiftly squeezed the liquid out of the ball of the tissue and pressed it against the wound. Use your knife now. Cut the shirt away. Without hesitating, Little Bear obeyed. Boone lay still. His face is uh, his face under its tan and his face under its tan had turned ashy gray. It took me a minute to you know when you read something sometimes it just doesn't sound right. I'm going to finish up the chapter here. We need a bandage, said Patrick. There's nothing we could use, and we can't move him to uh, wrap it around him. We'll have to use a tiny bit of Band-Aid. Again, Patrick went to the bathroom, and again, Omri, Little Bear, and Boone were left alone. Little Bear knelt now with his hands loose to his thighs and his head down. His shoulders rose and fell. Was he sobbing with shame or fear, or could it be sorrow? Patrick returned the, with the box of Band-Aids and a pair of nail scissors. He cut out a square big enough to cover the hole on Boone's chest and Little Bear stuck it with great care and even, Omri thought, tenderness. Now, said Omri, take off your cheeks close cloak and cover him up warmly. This too Little Bear did uncomplainingly. We'll take him upstairs and put him to bed, said Omri. Oh God, I wish I had that key and could get that doctor back. As they walked slowly upstairs, he told Patrick about the First World War soldier he had brought to life to tend to Little Bear's leg wound. We've got to find that key, said Patrick. We've just got to. Little Bear, still at Boone's side on Omri's hand, and or said nothing. In Omri's room, Patrick made a bed for the cowboy from an unfolded handkerchief and another woolen square cut from Omri's sweater. Omri slipped a bit of thin, stiff card between Boone and his own hand, and he made and he transferred the man without too much disturbance, which might have started the bleeding again. He was still unconscious. Little Bear uh, silently stood by. Suddenly he moved. Reaching off, he snatched off his chief's headdress and threw it violently on the ground. Before Omri could stop him, he began jumping on it. And in two, in a second or two, all the beautiful tall turkey feathers were bent and broken. Leaving it lying there, Little Bear took off, or took off across the carpet, running as hard as he could over the deep woolen tufts, stumbling sometimes, but running away in the direction of the seed box and his home. Patrick moved, but Omri said quietly, let him alone. It must be chapter 15. The, that Chapter 15 is the one I've been thinking of. I thought it was chapter 14. This one was kind of a bummer. Um, Little Bear got his feelings hurt watching TV where, you know, in, a, in American movies, they weren't always kind to the Native Americans, and that's what happened. And he got his upset and decided to show Boone that he was tougher than him and unfortunately hurt him. So tomorrow we'll um, start chapter 15. It's called Underfloor Adventure. This is the one I was thinking of that's uh, a pretty good one. So hope you guys are safe. Hope you're enjoying the story. Uh, we'll uh, see, or I'll be back to read tomorrow.